Planting propagation. Plant propagation is the process which grows new plant from a variety of sources such as seeds, cuttings, and other plant parts. Plant propagation can also refer to the man-made or natural dispersal of seeds. Methods of plant propagation. There are two methods of plant propagation. The first one is sexual propagation. It is a method of reproducing and multiplying plants using seeds and spores. This is the most common and economical method of propagating plants. Some of the fruit trees that are propagated with seeds are santol, tamarind, guava, mango, and jackfruit. However, some plants like fruit-bearing trees that are produced from seeds may not have the same characteristics as the mother plants. The second method of plant propagation is asexual propagation. It's a method of producing plants by natural or by artificial. It means without using seeds. Natural method. Natural method of asexual reproduction multiply naturally in different ways. It includes the following. The first one is by underground runner. In this method, a single parent plant can grow many new plants in one season. For example, pineapple and sugar cane. Another example of plant that grows in natural method is by rhizomes or creeping stem. A thick woody underground stem, also known as creeping stem. In this method, the individual plant grows as the older part of the rhizome dies. Examples are ginger, cattails, and other grasses. By sucker is another example of plant that grows in natural method. By sucker is a stem or shoot from springs. In this method, a single parent plant can grow many new plants on the lower part of the stem or on the shoots from the roots of the plant. Example is bananas. Another example of plant that grows in natural method is by bulb. A short underground stem with thick fleshy leaves. In this method, a new plant develops from the bulb. The fleshy leaves of the bulb contain stored food which supply food for the growing bulb. Example is onions. Another example of plant that grows in natural method is by tuber. A fleshy portion of the underground stem that has buds. In this method, new plant grow from the buds, the eye-like structures on tubers. Examples are potatoes and camote. Artificial method of asexual reproduction. Plants are multiplied by cutting, layering, marketing, grafting, budding, and enarching. The first one is cutting. This is the simplest and easiest of method. By this, new plants are produced and multiplied. Vegetative parts such as leaves, stems, and roots are removed from a plant. The lower part of the cut portion is buried in the soil. A number of plants, including the rows, are easily propagated by this method. Cuttings may be divided into four classes. The first one is by tuber cutting. Tubers are thickened portion of either a leaf or stem. In making tuber cuttings, one eye or bud is left on each piece. Examples are camote, ube, and carrot. The second one is by root cutting. The roots are cut into pieces and planted horizontally in the soil. When the shoots grow, they are transferred to the permanent plots. Examples are guava, jackfruit, and citrus. The third one is by stem cutting. It is divided into two classes. The first one is hardwood cutting. It is made from mature twigs of the plants, intended to be produced as in the case of bougainvillea. 
The second one is softwood cutting. It may either be made from young and immature parts of the plants, as in the case of Gumamela and San Francisco. The length of the cutting should be from 15 to 25 centimeters. And finally, we have leaf cutting. The underside part of the leaves is spin down on the sand in the propagating bed, which then develops roots. Begonia is an example of plant propagated by leaf cutting. The leaves may also be cut into small triangular sections, each with good-sized vein or nerve and then inserted in the sandy soil like soft wood cutting. Propagation is the foundation of many businesses within the diverse industry of horticulture. Propagation of plants can be achieved by many successful methods, but one of the most widely used and simplest methods of propagation is by cuttings. Along with seeds, cuttings remain the backbone of modern plant production. Cuttings require special tools and environments that greatly increase the versatility of propagation. By making use of old as well as new methods of taking cuttings, we can increase the chances of successful propagation. In this program, we'll not only demonstrate the skills and techniques of growing plants from cuttings, but we'll also look at the science of cuttings so that we can come to understand how these techniques work. First, we'll take a look at some basic terms and definitions necessary for understanding the growth and development of a cutting, and go over the basic requirements for rooting. After reviewing the tools and special environments needed for cuttings, we'll see the proper techniques for collecting and sticking the cuttings. Let's now begin by defining some basic terms and concepts which will help us understand the science of propagating plants from cuttings. So what exactly is plant propagation? Plant propagation is the reproduction or multiplication of plants using seeds or other various tissues from a parent plant. To put it another way, plant propagation simply means making more plants. All of the many techniques of plant propagation fall into one of two main categories, seed and vegetative reproduction. In vegetative reproduction, also referred to as cloning or asexual reproduction, the plant is reproduced using a portion of vegetative tissues, such as a stem cutting. The resulting plants are genetically identical to the single parent from which the vegetative tissues were taken. In addition to cuttings, there are many other methods of vegetative propagation such as division and layering, but the principles of asexual reproduction remain the same. For instance, the flowers of this rock rose have been developed and selected for their deep pink color. To ensure that the unique flower color remains unchanged during reproduction, 
This variety must be propagated using vegetative techniques such as cuttings. In reproduction by seed, also called sexual reproduction, male and female genetic material, or DNA, is combined through the process of pollination and fertilization. This type of reproduction produces variable results with the new plants showing a mixture of traits from both parents. This seemingly random expression of inherited traits is called genetic variation. Genetic variation gives us the opportunity to develop unique plants which may be of greater value. Through cross-fertilization, we can combine the desirable traits from two parents of the same species. The seed that is formed and the resulting plant is called a hybrid. The industry of horticulture is full of hybrid plants as well as many unique, naturally occurring varieties. If a plant breeder develops a very desirable plant, then it will often be reproduced using vegetative methods in order to retain all of the desirable traits. When a new variety has great value, such as a new color of rose, the new variety may be worthy of a plant patent. This would make any further vegetative propagation illegal unless you hold the patent rights. There are many criteria plant breeders look for when selecting these new plant varieties. Some of the most common criteria include resistance to disease and pests, cold hardiness, and drought tolerance. We use vegetative propagation for ornamental plants to retain characteristics such as flower size, fragrance, rare colors, unique form, or a long vase life for cut flowers. Fruit varieties are additionally selected for their flavor, storage qualities, and their ability to tolerate harvesting and shipping practices. Once we have selected a plant with the traits we want, then we will usually need to reproduce them using vegetative techniques. Again, this ensures that those qualities seen in the parent plant are also expressed by the new plants. Aside from retaining any desired characteristics, many plants are reproduced by cuttings because the seeds are not viable or simply not available. Even if the seeds are viable, some seeds have a lengthy dormant period which can be unpredictable and irregular. Still, other seeds have special requirements for germination that may be complicated or time-consuming. Cuttings have become a very common method of vegetative reproduction. Many cuttings can be taken over and over again from the same parent plant, known as the stock plant or mother stock. Stock plants which are long-lived can yield thousands of cuttings over their lifetime, giving us great return on our initial investment. Now let's take a look at the anatomy of a cutting. Most of the cuttings we will take will usually be stem cuttings. The basic stem cutting consists of a length of stem, leaves, a terminal bud, also called the apical bud, lateral buds, also called side buds, and nodes. Nodes are the joints of the stem where the leaves and side buds are attached. Leaves and buds are usually removed from the bottom nodes of the cutting. The segments of bare stem in between the nodes are called internodes. 
we'll refer to these terms again as we begin working with stem cuttings. Stem cuttings have long been classified into four main groups, hardwood, semi-hardwood, softwood, and herbaceous cuttings. With a few exceptions, hardwood cuttings are taken from deciduous shrubs or woody trees such as the fig. Hardwood cuttings are collected during the cold, dormant seasons from late fall to early spring. The previous year's growth is usually ideal for this type of cutting. Semi-hardwood cuttings are also taken from woody shrubs and trees, but the cuttings are collected during the warm summer months. The cuttings are taken from new shoots where the wood has partially matured. Softwood cuttings are often taken during the late spring season from the soft new growth of many woody plants. Softwood cuttings in general will root quicker than other types of stem cuttings. Herbaceous cuttings are taken from the soft succulent growth found on flowering perennials and even some annual flowers. Herbaceous cuttings can be taken anytime as long as the plant is actively growing. These are probably the easiest cuttings to root and make a great confidence builder for beginning propagators. Stem cuttings are the most common type of cuttings but leaf cuttings and root cuttings can also be quite productive. Leaf cuttings are made in a variety of ways depending on the plant type. Leaf cuttings can be made with just the blade of the leaf as with Sansevieria or the leaf petiole may need to be taken along with the leaf blade as with Peperomia. Foliar embryos, although they are technically not true embryos, make for easy leaf cuttings since the new plants will form on the top side of leaves while still attached to the mother stalk. This gives the piggyback plant its curious leaf form. In contrast with leaf cuttings, root cuttings are less varied in terms of methods or techniques. Root cuttings are best if collected in the early spring and are effective with a variety of plants including this fig tree, Albizia julibrisson, Campsis radicans, and poplars. Now that we're familiar with the terms and concepts of cuttings, let's take a closer look at the rooting process for cuttings. The main goal with cuttings is to get the stem or other plant part to the point where it is self-sustaining. This requires the development of roots called adventitious roots. This process is also referred to as rooting. Adventitious roots are simply roots that arise from any part of the plant other than the seed embryo. So all roots that develop from cuttings would be considered adventitious roots. So what do our cuttings need in order to grow these new adventitious roots? Hormones are naturally occurring chemicals produced by all plants. A group of hormones called auxins are critical to the growth of adventitious roots. Auxins are now available in synthetic form for plants that are difficult to root. The naturally occurring auxins will accumulate in the base of a stem cutting due to the darkness and moisture of the soil. In addition to hormones, a suitable environment must be maintained during the rooting process. Until the cuttings develop roots, we need to provide 
most of the basic elements any plant would need to survive. This would include light, water, proper temperature, and aeration. Light is required to sustain the cutting during the rooting process. In greenhouse environments, sunlight stimulates the process of food production within the leaves. This fundamental process is called photosynthesis. At the same time, the sun raises the ambient temperature in the greenhouse. A misting system is needed to counteract the rising heat and possible dehydration of the cutting. Carbon dioxide is also critical to the photosynthesis process. Fortunately, carbon dioxide occurs naturally in great abundance and can be provided simply by good air circulation. Water is needed by the cutting to keep the plant rigid and to carry on basic life-sustaining functions. The evaporation of water from the leaf surface, known as transpiration, creates an important cooling effect on the plant. The water moving from the soil up the unrooted stem of the cutting provides only a small portion of the water needed by the cutting. Again, a misting system will usually compensate for the short supply of water. The proper temperature needed by cuttings will vary from plant to plant. The best temperature for rooting is usually lower than the ideal growing temperature for the rooted plant. Most plants will develop roots if provided with a temperature range between 18 to 25 degrees Celsius or 65 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Bottom heat increases our success with cuttings by stimulating cell division and promoting rooting but the above ground portions of the cutting benefit by staying relatively cool. In general, optimum rooting temperature is about 10 degrees higher for the rooting zone than it is for the leaf zone. By lowering the normal growing temperature at the leaf surface, we can reduce the stress on the unrooted cutting. The ambient temperature can be reduced by venting, shading, and the evaporative cooling effect of misting. Oxygen is a well-known byproduct of photosynthesis. Most of us have heard that plants make oxygen, which animals need to survive. But plants also need oxygen for many basic functions including the development of adventitious roots. Oxygen is very important during the process called callus formation. A callus is the scar tissue which forms at the base of the cutting, effectively healing the wound caused by our pruning shears. The buildup of callus is the first visible sign that the cutting is developing normally. In most cases, the new roots will grow out of this callus tissue. To enhance this callus formation, we need a rooting medium that is porous and allows oxygen to flow around the base of the cutting. Now that we're familiar with the basic rooting process, we're finally ready to stick the cuttings. A quick list of equipment we'll need before sticking the cuttings would include pruning shears, a plastic bag, or a large container for collecting the cuttings, rooting media and trays, or flats to support the cuttings, a misting system, and ideally some kind of bottom heat. Let's start out by taking cuttings of an herbaceous plant. Plants from the mint family are usually easy to root 
and stock plants are also easy to find. They can be recognized by square stems, strong scented leaves, and flowers that are arranged in whirls encircling the stem. This spearmint is easily propagated by cuttings and should root quickly in two to three weeks. With herbaceous cuttings, we want to select stems that are thick and sturdy. Once we've collected enough stems, we'll spray a little water over them to keep them from wilting. If possible, keep the stems out of direct sunlight. The rooting medium we're using is two parts perlite mixed with one part peat moss. We'll use a plug tray with deep cells and fill it to the top with our rooting medium. Wet the medium after it has been added to the plug trays. Now we're ready to stick the cuttings. Each length of stem should provide us with many cuttings. As a general rule, each cutting should have two sets of nodes stuck into the medium and two sets of nodes above the medium with the leaves still attached. So when we select the piece of stem for our cutting, it should have at least four nodes if possible. Cut off the stem just below the last set of nodes. The bottom nodes are typically prepared by stripping all the leaves off by hand. This speedy technique creates a large wound at the base of the stem where callus tissue will form and eventually grow roots. Leaves can also be removed with a pair of shears, but be sure to cut the leaves off close to the stem. The upper leaves can also be reduced by cutting them in half. This is not needed for mint, but it's an important technique for cuttings with large leaves. Also remove any flowers or flower buds which might drain the energy out of the cutting. Now stick the cuttings into the medium, just deep enough to give the plant support and far enough to cover the two lower nodes. Do not press the cutting to the bottom of the tray. This can cause the stem to dry out. As the cuttings are pushed in place, Try to keep the leaves arranged so that they don't cover the stem tips of nearby cuttings. This is where the new shoots will sprout out. We can also prevent diseases by positioning or even pruning the leaves so that they don't come in contact with the medium. Once the tray is filled, it is ready for the misting system. Quick rooting herbaceous cuttings only need to be misted three or four times per hour, depending on the temperature. The plant should only be misted during daylight hours and never during the night. Another type of stem cutting we've mentioned is the hardwood cutting. Hardwood cuttings should be collected during the cold, dormant months. The leaves of this edible fig Ficus carica have fallen off indicating it is now dormant. When harvesting the bare branches, select stems that are about one half to three quarters of an inch in diameter. Make the cuts just below a node. With each cutting measuring about nine inches in length. Bundle the hardwood cuttings together and let the bottom ends of the cutting stand overnight in a solution of rooting hormone. After the hormone treatment, it's helpful to let the pruning wounds callus over before planting. Store the cuttings in a moist container over wood chips or peat moss for about a month or until well-defined callusing is noticeable. After callusing, be sure that the cuttings are planted the right side up, with the bud tips pointing upward and the leaf scar positioned just below the bud. If rooting is successful, 
these buds will begin to push out leaves in the spring. The fig tree is also a good plant for propagating by a root cutting. Most root cuttings should be made in early spring when the roots still have plenty of food stored from the previous dormant months. Cut out sections of medium-sized roots, one quarter inch to one half of an inch in diameter. Since there are no buds to indicate which direction is up, we should cut the base of each root cutting with a diagonal cut. And then remember to point all the diagonal cuts in the downward position when sticking the cuttings. The top of the cutting may need to be recut flat so that all the tops are level and all the bottoms are pointed. We'll make each of these root cuttings about four inches long. As with hardwood stem cuttings, the fig's root cuttings should be stored in a moist box for about a month. The root cutting can then be planted in rooting media or directly into the field where the entire root piece is covered with soil. Aside from stem cuttings and root cuttings, leaf cuttings are also an easy propagation method, especially for some tropical plants and succulent plants. With many succulents, such as these donkey tail, the leaves can be broken off and simply set directly on the surface of the potting soil. Another type of leaf cutting, called the leaf blade cutting, only uses segments of the leaves for rooting. One of the most common examples of the leaf blade cutting is made using Sansevieria, commonly called the snake plant or mother-in-law's tongue. Three to four inch sections are sliced up, giving the downward or distal end of each leaf a slanted cut. This technique, as shown earlier with root cuttings, will help us maintain proper orientation when sticking the cuttings. Using a standard propagation medium, push the cuttings halfway into the rooting medium, remembering to point the slanted end of the leaf downward into the medium. These leaf blade cuttings will usually root in eight to 10 weeks. A variation on the leaf blade cutting is the midrib cutting used with the streptocarpus. After removing an entire leaf, use a razor or sharp knife to cut out in the middle of the center leaf vein known as the midrib. Place the halves in a rooting medium buried about a half an inch. These leaf cuttings will need to be set under mist for about two months. These pups are now ready to be divided and transplanted. Another type of leaf cutting is the leaf petiole cutting, in which the entire leaf, including the petiole, is used. This peperomia is one of the many tropical plants that will root easily with this method. The petiole is pushed into the rooting media until the bottom of the leaf blade contacts the media. New roots and pups will emerge in a month or two. The rooted leaves and pups can then be transplanted into pots. African violets are also propagated using this technique. An unusual type of leaf cutting is the foliar embryo. As mentioned earlier, foliar embryos are technically not true embryos, but they do make easy leaf cuttings. The foliar embryo of Tolmia menziesii, commonly called the piggyback plant, sprouts a new plantlet or pup from the base of the leaf blade. These small plants are often already formed on the adult leaf, complete with tiny roots. They merely need to be set on some potting medium in order to sprout roots. 
we'll use the direct stick method, which skips the need for transplanting the rooted cuttings. With direct stick, we use the pot that the plant will eventually be sold in. In the case of the piggyback plant, we're making a hanging basket for use as a house plant. We'll use regular potting soil instead of the rooting media since the cuttings will only need to be misted for a short time. Now that we're familiar with the basic methods for sticking cuttings, let's see how to grow on and transplant the cuttings once they have rooted. While the cuttings are developing roots, we should be checking on them every week or so to see if there is any callus formation at the base of the stem. Slow callus formation is often a sign that the media is not draining well or the duration of the mist may be too long. The duration of mist should be long enough to cover the leaves evenly usually between three to five seconds. The interval between misting should be long enough so that most of the water has already evaporated from the leaf surface. This misting interval will also depend on the type of plant being propagated. In warm greenhouses, misting intervals can run anywhere from one misting every 10 minutes to one misting every 30 minutes. If our misting program is scheduled correctly, we should soon observe roots growing out of the bottom of the tray. We can also check for rooting by giving the cutting a gentle tug from the leafy top of the cutting. If the cutting slips easily up and down, then the roots most likely haven't developed yet. While the roots are forming, the cuttings need to be regularly inspected for disease problems. Remove any signs of diseased tissue such as dark spots, black leaf tips, or grayish-white threads. Keeping the rooting tray clean will also help prevent disease infection. Pick up any rotting or fallen leaves and throw out cuttings that are obviously not going to take. As we mentioned, starting out with a well-draining, sterile soil will prevent many disease problems. Programming the mist schedule so that plants are not overwatered will prevent disease as well as algae growth. In addition, providing good air circulation and bright light will help control many diseases. If fine-tuning our horticultural practices is not effective, then diseases may be prevented by spraying or drenching with fungicides. Once the cuttings have rooted evenly throughout the tray, then they should be taken off the misting benches and watered only when dry or nearly wilting. Watering one to three times a day is usually enough. Transplant the cuttings into a potting mix that has better water retention than the rooting media. Equal parts of peat moss and perlite will make a good potting medium for most plants. Water the cuttings into their new pots, even if the medium was already moist. This ensures good contact between soil and roots and also reduces transplant shock. If we are transplanting the rooted cuttings directly into the field, make sure they have a hardening off period. Hardening off gives plants that have lived inside the greenhouse a transition period to get used to the harsher conditions found outside of the greenhouse. The plants are simply set outside for a week or two before transplanting into the field or landscape. Hardening off reduces the stress of that final move into the field environment where the plant will complete its growth and development. In this program we've looked at many aspects of propagation of plants by cuttings. 
have studied the basic anatomy of cuttings as well as the process of callusing and root development. We also went over the basic horticultural practices that will ensure success and finished by showing how and when the cuttings should be transplanted. We hope that the combination of botany, biology, and horticulture covered in this program has sparked the interest of our viewers to continue studying and experimenting with the many techniques of plant propagation. Another example of plant that grows in artificial method is layering. This is a method by which plant grows from the buried portion of the parent plant. This is done by bending a ranch until it reaches the soil. The part touching the soil is partly covered as soon as the new plant is established. It is cut from the parent plant and transferred to a new place. Example is rose. Marketing is another example of plant that grows in artificial method. In this method, a strip of bark from around the plant is removed. The strip part is wrapped with soil and secured with a piece of cloth or plastic. When roots start to grow, the branch is cut off and planted in the soil. Where coated plants bear fruits much earlier than the trees planted from seeds. Steps in marketing. First, Remove a ring-like layer around the desired branch. Step 2. After the bark is completely peeled off, scrape off the slippery lining that covers the branch. Third, place moist sawdust around the area where the bark has been peeled off. Step 4. After placing the rooting medium around the cut area, hold it with coconut husk or transparent plastic sheet. Tie this firmly in place. Fifth, Water the marcoated area for 2 to 12 weeks. And lastly, after it has developed a good root system, remove the cover, separate the branch from the mother plant, and transfer it in the garden. Grafting is another example of plant that grows in artificial method. In this method, a cut stem from one plant is inserted into the other plant stem so that the grafted stem will grow there permanently. The cut branch is called cyan. There are two grafting methods. The first one is whip grafting. It is usually employed when the both cyans and the stock are about the same size or about two years old. Cut cyan diagonally from one and one half inches according to the size. Make a vertical splice on the cyan and the stock and join the two together by inserting the tongue of the scion to the cleft of the stock. The second one is cleft grafting. This is the most common and easiest method of plant's propagation. The stock about a pencil size or more is cut off squarely and a wedge-shaped scion is inserted in it. Another example of plant that grows in artificial method is budding. This is a method of transferring the lateral bud to grow the scion to the stock of the same species. It is used for young plants or small branches. There are two methods of budding operation. The first one is shield or tea budding. It is an easy form of grafting or propagating where a bud rather than a shoot 
is attached to a rootstock to make a new plant. The second one we have patch budding. This method is used for thick bark trees like santol, citrus, kainito, rambutan, and others. And finally, we have enarching. It is another example of plant that grows in artificial method. It is a method of propagating plant in which the cyan is made to unite with the rootstock as they grow independently. Planting procedures and techniques. Why selection of planting materials and proper land preparation for planting fruit trees ensure good quality yields? Factors to consider in selecting good planting materials. When selecting the kinds of planting materials, consider the following factors. The first one is size and shape of plants. Choose good size and shape of trees that will produce good quality fruits. Second, plant vigor. Healthy seedlings must be selected. Third, variety. Choose a variety of fruit trees that are high quality and adapted to the soil and climatic condition of the place. And lastly, early fruiting. This will provide satisfaction and early return of investment. Preparation for planting trees. First, prepare the young plant taken from the nursery. Take an extra care handling them so as not to damage its roots. Second, estimate how long the roots of the young plant are. Then dig a hole which is slightly wider and deeper than the roots of the young plant. Provide extra space below and at the sides of the hole to help the roots of the young plant to establish. Square holes are much better because the roots of the tree can go round as it grows. Unlike in round holes, it will only break out. Third, the hole should not be too deep. The transplanted young plant should be of the same height on the ground as it was on the nursery. Backfill a little if the hole is too deep. Planting too deep in the ground will rot in the stem of the young plant. Planting too shallow the roots which is above the ground will die. Put the young plant in the hole, then replace the soil until the hole is completely filled. See to it that the soil is firm around the young plant so that the roots will not be immobilized. Fourth, keep the soil firm. You can use the back of your boot, but do not compact the soil through hammering it down like a concrete. Compact soil will cause the roots of the young plant to die because it prevents water and air circulation. Lastly, water the new transplanted young plant. 